Hallelujah. If you're comfortable, why don't you slip why don't we slip up our hands and just give the Lord just some some more time, just in worship. Oh God, we thank you, Lord. Lord, we confess, oh God, that we need you. We need you, oh God. Lord, today we need you. We need your presence, oh God. We need your grace, oh God. Oh God. Lord, we give you praise. We give you praise. Oh God. Oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Let's worship Him. go to the Lord in prayer. If there's a few needs we need to remember. We need to remember Tracy. Uh, our uh, children's pastor, she went in uh, for a hernia operation and she's now recovering, so we need to pray that God would give her strength. Wayne Grasser needs our prayers. He has cancer and uh, they found a spot in his brain and so they're changing the treatment a little bit and trying to take care of that. Uh, Peter uh, Legere had an uncle that passed away. We want to pray for that family. And also we want to pray for the Potters. Uh, the Potters served as our missionaries for a number of years. Uh, they've recently resigned from PAOC ministry. And uh, we want to pray that God would just direct their lives wherever the Lord leads them, that God would bless them and, uh, and use them for in whatever direction they go in. Let's bow our hearts together. Father, right now we bow in your presence, O God. Lord, we lift up Tracy to you, O Lord, and we pray. Let your hand be upon her life. Lord, as she's in the process of recovery, Lord, bring healing quickly within her body. Protect her from infection. Protect her from complications. And Lord, let healing be upon her. Father, I pray for Wayne, O oh God. We thank you for the work that you've done in Wayne's life. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that you'd strengthen him. Bring healing upon him. Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray, O oh God, for Peter's family, O oh God, the uncle that passed away. For the siblings, O oh God, the children, O oh Lord. Lord, I pray you touch this family and comfort them, O oh God, as they go through this process of mourning. Give them strength, O oh God. Lord, I pray for Maurice and Marine Potter, O oh God, as they've stepped down from being missionaries, Lord, with the Pentecostal assemblies. We pray, O oh Lord, you direct their lives. Bless them, O oh God. Whatever direction they would go in, let them find you and find strength in you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, folks. You may be seated.
we have been talking about healing. And uh, we want to uh, continue that thought today on the subject of healing. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Jesus Christ as our Lord, as our Savior. And, uh, and then last week, we began the thought of Jesus Christ, our healer. And um, we talked about healing, and healing for our definition, what we're using for a definition of healing is the restore, being restored to health through the divine intervention of God. Being restored to health through a divine intervention of God. Uh, last week we talked about the scope of healing and uh, that uh, the Lord wants to touch every part of our lives. He wants to heal us physically, and we can speak about sickness and addiction. He wants to heal us emotionally. He wants to heal us spiritually if we're being attacked by the enemy. He wants to heal us socially so that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can uh, not be in any way hindered in relationships across culture or any other barrier within our society. When we think of social healing, one of the areas uh, that I kind of include under that, but it may be better under emotional healing, is uh, healing from an angry spirit. Uh, and, and God can do that. I had one individual come to me after the service, and uh, they've been coming to the church for a, a couple of years. And uh, they committed their life to Christ and followed the Lord in water baptism and uh, and uh, they, they came to me and said, Pastor, I want to tell you that since I started coming to this church, I came as an angry person, but that anger is gone. And that's, that's the healing power of God, the transforming power of God. We talked about the, the God's nature is to heal. That is a part of who God is. He is a healing God. Exodus chapter 15 says, I am the Lord who heals you. And from that we, we have the word uh, Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord our physician. I'm getting a little bit of a ring in this, Peter. I don't know if you can get it out. Can you folks hear that? Is that just ringing in my ears? I've got a little, there's a little ring, but uh, you can work on that and try to pull that out. That would be great. Last week we dealt with the thought that healing was purchased for us from the cross. Isaiah said, surely he has taken up our infirmities. The inf word infirmities means sicknesses. And carried our sorrows, which means a mental pain. Yet we considered him stricken by God, spit, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Through his stripes, we are healed. Healing is a normal part of the Christian life, a normal part of the New Testament church, I should say. We look at the four Gospels and we find 30 accounts of divine intervention, divine healing. But, last week we shared, not everybody in the New Testament was healed. Paul had his thorn in the flesh. And it's been discussed what that is. There seems to be some indication that it was his eyesight because uh, there's an indication that he lost his eyesight or it became very difficult for him to see in his later years. Uh, also, um, Timothy had a problem with his stomach and he was never healed. There's never any record of a healing taking place for him. Our, our last final thought from last week was this. I believe that there is... A new age coming when all will be healed. And we talked about this thought that I was healed because of the cross. By his stripes we were healed, Peter says. That I'm being healed. That, that there's a, sometimes that in that process of healing we are divinely healed immediately. Debbie shared her testimony. And sometimes healing is a process that we have to work our way through. We have to walk it out. And Lori talked about walking out the healing and God just kind of works in the process and sometimes even uses our, our, our infirmities to strengthen us in our spirit 
We think about Paul's thorn in the flesh, and someone was talking to me about this uh, this week. And Paul had a thorn in the flesh. But you know what? It's one thing to have a thorn in the flesh, and it's a different thing to have a thorn in our spirit. It's one thing to have some struggles with the old physical body, and I can guarantee you, if you live long enough, you'll have some aches and pains of some sort. Anybody here without a few aches or pains of some sort within their life? Anybody? Besides, no, I'm not going to put my hand up. Well, there's a few. There's a few that, that their body is still operating. At, uh, I look at John Crew, and John Crew is, is, is uh, 97, and uh, he's like the Timex watch, takes a licking and keeps on ticking. This man just keeps going. And I'm sure he's got a few aches and pains, but God is with him and has given him strength. But can I say, there's one thing for us to struggle with their body, that's life. But there's another thing, if you get a thorn in your spirit, and you get a root of bitterness, or you get an offense you can't let go of, then can I tell you, I would rather see you healed in spirit than healed in body. I believe God is that there's healing for both but you know a sick body will simply send you to heaven earlier a sick spirit can ruin your walk with God there is coming a day there is a future kingdom there's a new order coming the Bible says that he will wipe away every tear and there'll be no more death no more mourning, no more crying, and no more pain. Hallelujah. There's coming a day when everybody will receive healing. Today, I want to think about this thought. What does the New Testament teach us about healing? Number one, healing is connected with faith. There is a connection between healing and faith. Hebrews 11 says, "Faith." Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain what we do not see. That word faith. The word faith means divine persuasion. I like that. I, you know, of all the definitions I've come across for faith, I, I like this one the best. Divine persuasion. Allowing yourself to be persuaded by God, by His Word, that there is something that God has for you. I believe we need that type of faith. Now, I believe the world is full of faith, and I've said this before. I came to church because I had faith in the Ford. I get out in my little uh, uh, putt-putt and uh, turn the key, and the focus started, and uh, it brought me, and I had no question. I didn't call a taxi to have um, them on standby because I had faith in my Ford. And maybe you had faith in your Chev. It takes a lot of faith to drive a Chev. I've had a few. That's the reason I have faith in the Ford. Some people have faith in uh, their hockey team. All the way, baby, we were saying until this past few days, all the way. Montreal is going to take the cup. I, it was misguided faith. It was false confession. I tell you what. <laughs> it was bad refs. There you go. I thought you said bad breath at first, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, listen, they're all the way, all the way to the golf course now. That's what Montreal is doing. We can have faith in people. And generally, we, we go very quickly and we put trust in people, don't we? We put faith in people. Whether it's the cashier or whether it's the cop that pulls us over. Yes, sir, I know. If you said I was driving 20 kilometers over the speed limit, yes, I was, sir. We put trust in them because they had this little radar. I've never had one of those for a long time. Thank goodness it isn't because I haven't tried. Folks, we need to put faith in God. Allow God to divinely persuade us that His Word is real, that God has good things for our life. Being divinely persuaded that we have a good God 
and that God has good things for us. That's what faith is. It's being allowing God to persuade us that He is good. Healing is connected to faith. How many have ever heard of people saying, well, if you had more faith, you'd be healed? Have ever, anybody ever heard that expression? Come on, slip your hand up. Well, if you just had more faith, you'd be healed. The, the, there's a doctrine out there that says, well, if you're not healed, it's because you have lack of faith. It's because you don't have enough faith. If you're walking in sickness, it's because you don't have enough faith. If you're having a struggle meeting your bills, it's because you don't have enough faith. If you're going through a hard time in life, it's because you don't have enough faith. I'd like to debunk that theology first of all today. Number one, healing can be a result of the person's faith requiring healing. I'm going to show you three ways faith is connected. And those who hold this doctrine, well, if you're not healed, it's because of your lack of faith. It's because they don't understand Scripture. And they need to get some faith themselves and pray for you. Let's look at this. Now, now in this, keep in mind, not everybody is healed. Today, or in the New Testament. Sometimes healing happens, but I want to look at whose faith brings healing. And I think there's been some terrible things done, terrible things said to individuals who are sick. Could you imagine the gall of some people? Here this poor person is, and I've had people come to me and talk to me about this. This poor person is sick in the hospital, If you're physically sick and your body is struggling, you'll struggle emotionally and spiritually. Why? Because we're body, soul, and spirit. And here this person is struggling with sickness and some person comes up to them and said, well, if you just had more faith, you would get out of this bed and go home. You know, you just like to throttle some people. But I, I'm not doing that. I'm just... Let me share the word, and, and if, if you come across someone that says that, send them to the website and tell them to listen to this sermon. Healing can be the result of the person's faith requesting healing. I'm going to give you a few stories. Here's an example of someone who was healed because of their faith. Mark chapter 10. You can follow along in the scripture if you like, and this is just a, one of the beautiful stories of, of healing. It says, then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Barnabas, that is, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside and begging. Okay, let's stop there for a second. And get the picture in your mind. Jesus is traveling with a large crowd. And Jesus normally traveled with a large crowd, but his crowd was going uh, for a particular purpose at this point because the Passover is at hand, and Jesus and his disciples and those who were following him were on their way to the Passover. Everyone within a certain distance of Jerusalem was, was required to go to the Passover unless there was something that, you, that was so severe that you couldn't travel. So you have this, this great jovial, uh, jovial group. They're, they're laughing and they're singing and they're, they're having fun and they're, they're making their way down uh, and they pass through Jericho on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. And along the side of the road, there was a blind man. He's a beggar. He can't go with them. And how his heart would long that he could join the group and join the laughter and join the singing as they were making their way for this great celebration of the Passover. Yet he was blind. Yet he was bound. And he could not go. We have the setting. The blind man. that Wishing he could go and meet with God. At the Passover. When he heard that it was Jesus, in verse 47, 
when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Jesus, son of David, had mercy upon me. And we see in this confession, he was calling out to Jesus as the son of David, this man who was blind, Bartimaeus, he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And he was calling out to him, recognizing that he was the Messiah of the Lord, the Savior of the world. Have mercy upon me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy upon me. And, and, and again, the scene, the large crowd, this man shouting out. He was loud above all the other voices. Imagine the sound of a crowd. And yet from the crowd, this one voice pierces through the hole. Of all the sound, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me. Scripture indicates that those who rebuked him rebuked him in a nasty manner. Told him to be quiet. Told him in the most clear, certain ways that he needs to shut his mouth. He's a blind beggar. How dare this man interrupt their celebration? Verse 49, I like this phrase. It simply says, Jesus stopped. Oh, what, that we would have the type of faith that would stop our Lord. That a prayer of ours would reach heaven and the movement around the throne would stop. And Jesus would say, I hear someone calling in faith. And Jesus stopped and he said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up. On your feet, he's calling you. Verse 50 he says, that he threw his cloak aside. He jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. And of course, you know, him throwing the cloak aside was an important act of faith because uh, the uh, individuals who were beggars, were giving a, a particular coat. It was a, a coat that was issued to him uh, by the, 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 the Jewish leadership. And that coat meant that he was a beggar. And if he had that coat on, you recognize that he was a beggar. It was, it was the secret to his source of income was to wear this coat and stand there with a can. And just call out for alms for the poor. He threw his coat aside. His source of income, he laid it aside. He jumps to his feet and comes to Jesus. What do you want me to do? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and follow Jesus along the road. In this, hear this, that this man immediately received his sight. He was immediately healed. And the next thing he does is he's following Jesus on the road, on the way to the Passover, to go and meet with God. To be with Jesus and to be a part of this great celebration. We find here a, a great example of an individual whose own faith brought healing. Let me take you to another story. Because not always is healing in the New Testament a result of the individual's faith needing healing. Mark chapter 2, we find this story. Healing can be a result of the person's faith who is bringing someone to Christ. Follow along with this. It's not the person's faith that's requiring heal, healing, but it's the people's faith that brought the person. The story, Mark chapter 2, is the story of the paralyzed man that was brought to Jesus by four individuals. Follow along with me in the story. It says, a few days later, 
when Jesus again entered Capernaum and the people heard that he'd come home. So mother, so many so many gathered that there was no room. Not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Now, we don't know how many guys there were, but we know that there was at least four. It tells us some men came, and four of them were carrying. This kind of the feeling that there's more than four, but there was at least four of them. And on a stretcher, it's important to have four people, isn't it? If you have three people on a stretcher, but he's going to fall out. So we know there's at least four because the scripture said that there's four. Verse 4 says this, Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, and just notice that they had to dig through it, after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man uh, was laying on. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And after that, he said, Rise up, take up your mat, and walk. Whose faith was it? It was the faith of four men that climbed up on a roof. Palestine, the, the buildings, they, they lived in houses, and the houses... Uh, had flat roofs. The flat roofs were, were great because you could walk up in the, uh, the... Normally there was a stairway that took them up to the top, up on the roof. And a lot of times people would go up there and, and rest. And, and uh, if you remember, there's a story about Peter going up on the roof and resting. And there God gives him a vision. But going up on the roof as a place to rest. Now, the roofs were flat. And uh, the construction of the roof is once they had the walls up, they would take poles and lay across about three feet apart across the top. And from there, they would put smaller branches across the other way. And then they would take and pack everything with clay. So you have the, the walls, you have the trusses across it, the beams across it. Then across the beams, you lay branches. And then you pack everything with clay so you have a thick clay roof that's clay and then branches over top of the beams. Do you have that picture in your mind? Picture this. Jesus is there in the living room preaching the word. And he's preaching away and then he hears someone walking on the roof. Creak, 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 creak. And he pauses and goes back into preaching the word. Then all of a sudden he hears us bang, bang, bang on the roof. And the clay begins to break up. And chunks of clay are falling down all over him. And branches are falling down until they've got a hole that's three feet wide through the roof. And then Buddy comes down on the mat, <laughs> right down to him. And Jesus looks up and he sees four heads sticking down through the hole. Great big smiles on their face. They've done it. They've accomplished it. And Jesus looks up and he says, because of your faith, this man is healed. You see, faith, healing is always connected to faith, but it's not always the person who is sick that has the faith. Sometimes it's the other people around him. Sometimes it's some of the friends that have faith. Debbie was in the hospital. She was in a coma. How ridiculous would it be for me to go and say, Debbie, you get faith and you get healed. Wouldn't it be much better for us to call a prayer meeting and have the people begin to pray for her and intercede for her? Folks, healing is a result of faith, but it's not always the person needing the healing required to have the faith. Sometimes it's the friends that have faith. If someone comes to you and says, well, if you had more faith, you'd be healed. 
You tell them, go have a prayer meeting, and you get faith for my healing. Because it's scriptural. Equally is scriptural. We can have faith, or maybe it's our friends that have faith. Let me give you another one. Healing can be a result of the person's faith who is praying for the sick person, who's praying for the individual to be healed. John chapter 5, starting at verse 1, says, Sometime later Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool that in the Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of the uh, here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Down to verse 5. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been there, uh, that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me in the pool. And when the water is stirred, <clears throat> when I'm trying to get in, Someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. You find verses 10 11 talks about uh, the man as he's carrying his mat. He's caught by the religious police. And they said, How come you're carrying the mat and it's, your sa and it's a Sabbath? What are you doing? Verse 12. So they asked him, Who is the fellow who told you to pick up, <clears throat> who, pick up to, uh, who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. This man, this paralyzed man, 38 years paralyzed, had no idea who it was that said, pick up the mat. The question is, whose faith brought healing? Was it the man? Well, obviously not. He's there for 38 years. He was a man in the condition of a lot of people in the world. He said, I've got no one. I have no one to help me. What a sad situation. 38 years and he had no one. And this was a desperate situation. Who had faith? It wasn't his friends around him. The only answer was, this man was healed by the faith of Jesus. It's simply Jesus had compassion on him. Jesus heard about his story. It indicates that when Jesus learned about this, so someone told Jesus the story about this man. They were standing there. <clears throat> they were there, and someone must have approached Jesus, and they were talking about the invalids and the paralyzed. And, and someone said, well, there's one guy that's been here for 38 years, and they pointed him out. And Jesus had compassion on him. And Jesus, his faith, Jesus' faith healed the man. So if someone comes to you and says, if you had more faith, you'd be healed. You can tell them to go get a group of friends and pray for you. Or you can tell them, if you had enough faith, I'd be healed. If that person who's condemning you had enough faith, you'd be healed. Because they, you can be healed because of their faith. Healing is always connected to faith. But sometimes it's the faith of the person being healed, sometimes it's the faith of their friends, and sometimes it's the faith of them praying. Number two, I want to deal with. Sometimes people, when they're sick, 
will be approached by individuals and say, well, I wonder what you did to deserve this. Sickness is not always, ca uh, sickness is not always caused by sin. <clears throat> Maybe you've been here and you've wondered that yourself and you've been struggling with sickness and you've wondered, what have I ever done to deserve this? What evil have I done in my life that I should have this sickness upon me? And I say sickness most often is caused by natural causes. Yes, sometimes there are spiritual causes, but most time if you're sick it's because you've got a germ or you've been in contact with a bacteria or you've been involved in an accident of some sort. Sickness is not generally caused by sin, although it can be. John chapter 9 tells us this. As they went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and the disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. Now, the disciples were trying to come up with a good theological question for Jesus. Here's a man that was born blind. Now, if sickness made him blind, then the question was, uh, if, if sin made him blind, then the question was, whose sin? Was it his parents' sin? Or was it his sin in the womb? Now, could you imagine the discussion that was going on be between the disciples, be between uh, the time that they started discussing it and before they came to Jesus? And I could almost imagine Peter saying, well, I think it was the, the man's sin that caused him to be blind because he has to live with the blindness. Now, he must have sinned while in the womb. Could you imagine what that would look like? The evil little baby inside. <laughs> I'm going to get my mother. Poke, poke, poke. Oh, I felt that. Poke, poke, poke. <laughs> tickle, tickle, mom. Now what evil could he do in the womb? What evil could this boy have done? There's impossible. So the big question was, did the baby sin in the womb? Did the parents sin? And Jesus replied, Neither this man nor the parents sin. Come on, guys, wake up. It's not about the who sinned. Then Jesus goes on and says, But this happened to bring, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And God worked a miracle in his life. On some occasions, sickness can be connected to sin. The paralyzed man that was lowered through the roof, remember what Jesus said to him? Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. Then he told him to take up his mat and walk. And, and also, the, the man at the, the pool of Bethesda, you know what Jesus said to him after he met him? Later, the Bible says, Jesus found him. And he said this, see, you're well again. Stop sinning. Or something worse may happen to you. So it can be connected to sin, but it's not always connected to sin. When someone wants to condemn you, please let them know that sickness is not always related to sin. It can be more likely related to what is just common, regular sickness. I was going to take a couple of minutes and talk about sickness can, in some ways be the result of demonic activity. I'm just, just let me touch on this very quickly because I don't want to take a lot of time on it. In a sense, all sickness is connected to the fall. Genesis 1 to 3, everything was going pretty good. Genesis 3 on, there's a wreck. I mean, it's a real train wreck. And because of that, sickness has come upon the earth. And so because of the fall, everything is connected the powers of hell and there are times when we are attacked by the enemy and God desires to set us free but can I say whether your sickness is a result of simply just being sick whether you're sick because you failed in some way and that's uh, uh, brought something on you 
because of your own maybe foolishness, maybe it's uh, struggling for years with a struggle with uh, smoking or, or drinking and you've got physical problems because of it. Or maybe it's an attack of the enemy. Can I tell you the answer, no matter what it is, is found on the cross. Jesus can be your healer. Or Jesus can be your sustainer through your time of struggle. My final thought is this. We should pray for the sick. It's James chapter 5. James taught us how to pray for the sick. He said this, If any one of you, uh, is any one of you sick, he should call the elders of the church to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will, rise him, will raise him up. And if he has sinned, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous man is powerful and effective. Three things. Number one, for those who are requesting prayer for healing, we see number one, initiative. Look at what it says. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church. If you're sick, please call us. If you're struggling, you know, one of the the worst things I hear is someone come to me and say, Pastor, I was in the hospital for the whole last week. No one visited me. And I didn't even know about it. And no one knew about it. No one visited. Well, he didn't tell anybody. The Bible says, if you're sick, call somebody. Get on the phone. Make a phone call. And I believe real faith has initiative in it. If we have faith, we'll reach out. Even when we we feel that we're struggling, we want to reach out for somebody else's faith. But reach out when you're struggling. Have initiative. Call the elders of the church. Second thing we see is they anointed them with oil. Now, there's nothing special in the oil. I've got a a little bottle of anointing oil right up here. And there's nothing special in the the oil. It's just oil. But it's the symbol of the oil because the oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit. And we're praying that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and bring healing to you. The third thing we see is confession. Confession. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. If we confess and trust God, confess our sins, make sure our heart is pure. And you say, well, as far as I know, I've not done anything wrong. Well, it's a good chance for some house cleaning. And just generally ask God to cleanse your heart and pray that God will bring just you into a place of absolutely clean before him and then we pray for healing pray that God will touch your life I want to pray for people this morning we're going to go into our communion service in our communion service we're going to invite you to come and gather around the front but if you're here today and you'd like to have prayer for healing, I'm going to ask you to gather right right here in the very front of the center section. And during the communion service, we will pray that God will bring healing upon your life. We'll pray, anoint you with oil, and pray the prayer of faith, and trust God for healing in your life. I think after preaching for two weeks on healing, we should pray for healing. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask the, uh, the board members, ushers to come forward and, uh, and uh, join us at the front for the communion. Could you stand together as a congregation?